person came in to that wonderful company of March of Time. We had a Welsh shacked, and he was going to play a Welshman. And of course, that glorious voice, Paul Stewart, who was an actor, as you all know from pictures, but he was always on the air before that. He was on the March of Time and on many other shows. He heard Orson and said that he introduced that voice to the company of the March of Time. And when Orson came in, he was such an overwhelming presence because of his youth, maybe he was 19 about that time, and he was so gaunt and hungry looking. And uh, <laughs> it was a rough time. I don't mean that to be in any way comical because a lot of people were not eating regularly in the theater. <laughs> and it was all very obvious in this eloquent performer who gripped us all the minute he opened his mouth. It was thrilling, absolutely thrilling. The voice and the performance was something never to be forgotten. Do you suppose Orson was ever out of work? I mean, yes, he was he start, on work. And this was the first was work he had had. He was doing, I forget if Ted was with him at that time, I think this was perhaps before Shoemaker's Holiday that he came on March of Time. And things were very, very spare for him. In 1947, wanting to bring Macbeth to film, Wells teamed with producer Charles K. Feldman to convince Herbert Yates, president of Republic Pictures, to finance. Wells guaranteed to deliver a completed negative of Macbeth on a budget of $700,000. When some members of Republic's board expressed misgivings on the project, Wells agreed to personally pay any amount over the initial ask. He brought Irish actor Dan O'Herley in as Macduff, and cast former child star Roddy McDowell as Malcolm. Longtime friend and radio legend Jeanette Nolan would play Lady Macbeth. You asked about Macbeth. He came to our house here. We were surprised when he came, and he described to John and me his idea, and he came to us because he said he wanted Lady Macbeth to be kind of a wife like John had. <laughs> didn't want her, you know, with all of the evil overtones. And he said, I'm going to try to be like you. You know, he was so funny. I John, <laughs> he loved John. He was bringing Dan from Ireland to do Macduff. And so he said to John, the only part you can't play are my part and Macduff. But he says, you can play anything else you want. <laughs> and John said, I will only play the part that has the least lines. <laughs> so he said, and I don't want to have to learn lines. Oh. But anyway, he described his dream of making what you could almost call an entirely wholesome pair of people out of Lady mm -hmm. Macbeth and Macbeth, which was surprising to us, you know. We hadn't really read it that way. <laughs> and so, Nor had anyone else. I know. But it was very interesting, and he wanted it to be barbaric. And then he laughed, you know, and he said, of course, your Montana background, that'll take care of all of that rustic part of it. But he said, I want it to be all black and all white. And he said, I know I can't get that, but I have a great cameraman who will do the very best he can to make it look like a woodcut. That's how he visualized it. Hmm. He wanted it to look like a series of woodcuts. And he said, I want the Scottish. I want that brogue, I want that dialect throughout the cast. That goes with the barbaric aspects of my version in this particular dramatization of Macbeth. So we were quite overwhelmed and amazed that he had come to see us and that he offered us that opportunity to do that. Wells made several changes to Shakespeare's original, like adding significance to the witches. They were played by two other Hollywood radio legends, Peggy Weber and Sam Spade's Lorene Tuttle. Of course, a lot of the shows were put out awfully fast, you know. One summer, I did the Sam Spade show and the Orson Welles show all at once. It seemed to me they were on at the same time, practically. So. 
I said to Orson, I can't make this rehearsal. I can possibly make the show in about three minutes if I can get from NBC to CBS. But I said, I can't rehearse. And he said, well, come over and rehearse noontime then, during the lunch hour. So I would come over there, and of course he always loved to talk. And he would talk all through lunch, and I wouldn't get to rehearse with him because he always had a coterie of people around him, you know, and wanted to hear him talk. So I would just sit there, you know, with my script in my hand. Then I'd have to hand the script back because they'd say, oh, there'll be a lot of changes, so you better not take it with you. Wells expressed frustrations with wardrobes and the tight schedule. He had the cast pre-record all of their dialogue. Locations were leftover sets from westerns normally made at Republic. The entire production was done in 23 days in July of 1947. In September, Wells signed on to star in Gregory Ratoff's Black Magic, Shooting would take place in Rome. He wouldn't return until 1948. Republic initially trumpeted the film as an important work, entering it in the 1948 Venice Film Festival. But it was abruptly withdrawn after poor comparisons with Laurence Olivier's version of Hamlet also being screened. Life magazine gave the film a terrible review in October of 1948, saying that Wells' days as the boy wonder were long over. When he returned from Europe in the spring, Wells cut 20 minutes from the film at Republic's request and recorded narration to cover the gaps. But when it was finally released, it too was called a disaster. Wells' last appearance in the 1940s on American radio was in a pre-recorded segment on mail call over the Armed Forces Radio Service on October 13, 1948. Now 33 years old, Orson Wells had enough of Hollywood. He would move to Europe full-time. I always like to work with the top people. I'm not very good when I work with people who are not very good. <laughs> I'm just not. I like to work with people who are vibrant and know their business. I work a thousand times better if I have a challenge. I think it comes from being a Leo like I am. I just think, you know, because I'm a Leo, I just, I roar that way. Good evening, and with me once again is the man who uh, really makes the program possible with his fabulous collection of recordings, Ed Corcoran. Oh, thank you, Dick. That's very nice words. Ed, you know, I'm going to let you introduce our guest tonight because you had the opportunity to uh, meet him prior to the show. Maybe I can start off by asking what your license number is there, Mr. 137596. <laughs> what does that mean to you, Dick? <laughs> None other than Sam Spade, One of the alias things. Howard Duff, uh, Sam Spade and uh, many other famous roles in both radio, television, movies, and theater, Nick. So we've got another biggie here. Tonight. We certainly have. <laughs> Howard, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the golden age of radio and to put your career in perspective because you are known today by current day audiences on television and motion pictures, on the stage. You're uh, one of the few who had a major career in radio but has gone on to even more exciting things. You mean I've survived. real sense. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Goodbye. Now, wait a minute, Effie. You can't leave like this. Not without... Oh, all right. I'll talk to you while I'm putting my hat on. Well, can't you at least look at me? After all, you should give me a chance to justify... Sam, apparently you're laboring under an apprehension. Of course I am. Oh, boy, am I glad I picked the last in June and the first in July. What are you talking about? My vacation. Vacation? You just had a vacation a few months back. Well, Sam, that's a year. Well, if you want to take advantage of a legal technicality... Now, Sam, don't say goodbye, man. Well, it... Well, it's... Customary, I suppose. It's, it's lucky that some of us keep our nose to the grindstone, our ear to the ground, an eye to the future. Huh? Television's just around the corner, you know. Next time on Breaking Walls, it's the spring of 1946. Famed suspense director William Spear has finally agreed to take on another show. He'll cast a relative unknown actor named Howard Duff in the title role. Duff will become synonymous with his character, Sam Spade taking the lead into the 1950s. And as for Orson Welles in the 1950s? Well... Victims? Don't be melodramatic. Look down there. Would you really feel any pity if one of those 
dots stop moving forever? If I offered you 20,000 pounds for every dot that stopped, would you really, old man, tell me to keep my money? Or would you calculate how many dots you could afford to spend? Free of income tax, old man. Free of income tax. The only way you can save money now, Dave. A lot of good your money will do you in jail. That jail's in another zone. There's no proof against me. Besides you. Reading material used in today's episode was Citizen Wells by Frank Brady. This is Orson Wells by Wells and Peter Bogdanovich. On the Air by John Dunning. Discovering Orson Wells by Jonathan Rosenbaum. Orson Wells on the Air at orsonwells.indiana.edu and wellsnet.com. On the interview front, Orson Wells was with Peter Bogdanovich, Dick Cavett, Johnny Carson, Merv Griffin, Leslie McGahee. Dinah Shore, and Hugh Weldon. Byron Kane and Jeanette Nolan were with Spurvac. To find out more, please go to Spurvac.com. Norman Corwin was with Chuck Shaden. Hear their full chat at speakingofradio.com. Howard Duff was with Dick Bertel and Ed Corcoran for WTIC's The Golden Age of Radio. Hear their full chat at goldenage-wtic.org. Robert Wise was with Leslie McGahee. Jack Benny spoke with Jack Carney. Lorene Tuttle spoke with Same Time, Same Station in 1972. And Agnes Moorhead was with Dick Cavett in 1973. Selected music featured in today's episode was Perfida by Jimmy Dorsey and his orchestra, The Klezmer's Wedding by Andre Moisan, The Third Man by Anton Karras, Hooray for Hollywood by Don Swan, The Battle Cry of Freedom by Jacqueline Schwab, and Star of Bethlehem conducted by John Williams. Subscribe to Burning Gotham, the new audio drama set in 1835 New York City. It's available everywhere you get your podcasts and at burninggotham.com. A special thank you to Ted Davenport and Jerry Handages, two radio show collectors who help supply material for this episode. They're who the large retailers go to. Ted's got a Facebook group, Radio Memories. And for Jerry, please visit otrsite.com. I've been visiting since 2000. I'd also like to thank Walden Hughes and John and Larry Gassman of Spurvac. Listen to their shows on the Yesterday USA radio network. Breaking Walls episode 105 will spotlight the adventures of Sam Spade and reveal how the chemistry amongst those on the series helped create one of radio's most fun shows. This episode will be available beginning July 1st, 2020. Everywhere you get your podcast and at thewallbreakers.com. In the meantime, give Breaking Walls a quick rating on whatever platform you listen, especially iTunes. You can also join the Wallbreakers Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash the Wallbreakers. And if you've got some spare change, you can become a Patreon supporter for as little as a buck a month by going to p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the Wallbreakers. So, until July 1st, my name is James Scully. This has been Breaking Walls episode 104, and I'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you very much.